this video we're going to go through and break down human nutrition which for the last two years hasn't been a massive factor of the biology course but you can see in 2015 it was worth 60 marks so potentially that could be similar this year if you look at last year's question, it was the 15B, it was only something about bio, bio salts and realistically wasn't a full question on this at all, only worth a couple of marks. So first of all, we've got to talk about different types of nutrition, which you may or may not know from other chapters. In fact, a lot of this you may or may not know from other chapters. So nutrition, we talk about autotroph, something that can produce its own food, like a plant during photosynthesis, or a heterotrophic nutrition, like us, we can't produce our own food. Uh, we talk about herbivores, carnivores, carnivores and omnivores in, in terms of ecology. So a herbivore only eats plants, a carnivore only eats meat, and an omnivore actually eats both. Okay, you would definitely need to know examples of that, but again, that's more ecology. This horrendous diagram that I've drawn here is of the digestive tract or the alimentary canal, which goes from the mouth all the way down to the anus. And what I've tried to put in here are the main points of it outside the general, you put food in your mouth and it goes through your stomach. So first of all, we've got ingestion. And with ingestion, that's where we actually put the food into our mouth. Now in our mouth, we know that there's enzymes working on it, working in there. So for example, we've got amylase working on starch turning into maltose, but we also have physical digestion in the form of our teeth. Now we need to know our dental formula. We need to know about our incisors, canines, premolars and molars. Definitely just know that. Then it goes down our esophagus, and our esophagus works by peristalsis, where the muscles contract and push it down, almost like the last bit of toothpaste coming out of a tube as you are squeezing it. It then goes down into your stomach, and this is where digestion really begins. Like we know digestion is actually the breakdown of food, so it's breaking it down. Now it has happened here, but even more down here, because in our stomach we've got acids, we've got other enzymes, we've got bile, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. It then goes into our small intestine, which we'll talk about more over here, but inside our small intestine, that's where food begins to, our third process, be absorbed into our bloodstream. So our food is broken down into our biomolecules, etc., and it's absorbed into the bloodstream there. And the last part is we've got our large intestine, again, we'll talk about it a bit more in a second, uh, and that is really just a storehouse of waste. So we reabsorb water there and we egest, or egestion is the actual removal of waste. And that's not the same as excretion. Really important, you know that. I've drawn over here just on the diagram, randomly the, the liver, because the liver is massively important for us and for quite frequently the examiner asks you to pick that out. Uh, and then also potentially we might have to draw the pancreas, which kind of just looks like a leaf in and around the place. Now what else do I say we need to know? We need to know about the dental formula. We need to know about peristalsis there. We need to know about the role of fiber. So fiber is contained in plant cell walls uh, and it actually acts as roughage and it stimulates peristalsis and it stimulates us to actually again go to the bathroom. In terms of our stomach, we need to know about the gastric juices and why does the acid inside our stomach not actually cause a hole to appear in our stomach there? Well, there's actually a layer of mucus there is one, is one reason. And the other reason is that the pepsinogen is actually an inactive enzyme for us until it hits the acid. So it's not, not until it hits the acid with the food does it turn into pepsin and start breaking down proteins into peptides. Something that you probably know about from the actual construction of proteins and food and all that as well. But pepsinogen is inactive until it turns to pepsin with acid. So that's the sort of stuff we need to know. Okay, so when we're actually talking about glands here, we probably know about this from our endocrine chapter. Now we talked about the salivary glands actually being an exocrine gland, but just it's inside that chapter because they release saliva through ducts and we know that that has amylase which turns starch into maltose. In terms of the pancreas, one of our main ones from the endocrine chapter because it's a dual function gland, both an exocrine and endocrine, we need to know a little bit more about it here. It actually produces also sodium bicarbonate which helps neutralize the acid in your stomach and then neutralize the chime that's made inside there. Uh, we have to talk about how uh, the pancreas can actually, again, have amylase to turn starch and then lipase to actually act on lipids, lipase on, on acting on lipids, which break it down into our constituents of fat we know from the food chapter. The liver, which if they ask you where it's located, we're gonna say below the diaphragm. So the liver located below the diaphragm has a few key components. The majority of it is to do with bile. And that was possibly a junior cert idea that you would have learned, bile. Uh, and what does bile actually do? Well, first of all, it's made of dead red blood cells, which we know a lot about already and all, all their functions. Uh, second of all, even though it's made in the liver, it's stored in the gallbladder. So that's important to know. 
Uh, well, first of all, then, then, first of all, boil actually helps emulsify fats, which means again break it down. Uh, and second of all, it also uh, is involved with sodium bicarbonate and the neutralizing of the acids in your stomach. Here, when I have deamination, the liver is responsible for deamination, which is where we actually break down excess amino acids. So we can't actually store amino acids in our body the way we can other stuff. So the liver is responsible for actually breaking them down. In the small intestine, so if we go back to the intestines, we've got the small intestine and the large intestine. For lead and serp biology, we need to know a lot about the small intestine and how it's made of two parts. The first one is the duodenum, which again is still actually breaking down food just outside the stomach. And then the ileum, where the food really begins to be absorbed. And this diagram is crucial, knowing about these things here, these villi. As you go along the ileum, there's many, many, many millions of villi in there, which actually even have micro villi on them. And they actually are where the food gets absorbed. There's a fresh supply of blood there and a lacteal, which you might know from the lymphatic system, which absorbs fats, uh, which ensures that there's a massive surface area for all this food to be absorbed for your body to use it. Uh, so we villi and microvilli, what are the functions of these, uh, of these villi? Well, they have absorbed loads of things, but I've just put two up here, amino acids and glucose. And what's their adaption, which is an examiner's favorite question? Well, they have loads of microvilli on them and they have a fresh blood supply. There's thin walls with lots of blood, similar to what we've seen in the alveoli. Uh, only two more things. The large intestine is actually made of four pieces, but the main important ones for us are the colon, and the appendix, and the appendix we know doesn't cease to work, it ceases to have a function in humans. Uh, and then the last part we need to know is about symbiosis. Again, possibly you know from ecology, but symbiotic bacteria is bacteria that lives inside your digestive system. Not only does it get some food and shelter from you, but then for you, it produces vitamins that we could not actually produce in our body otherwise. And they're massively important. So symbiotic or symbiosis relationship, it works for both parties. Uh, symbiotic bacteria. You may remember in ecology you would have something similar with it, maybe bees and flowers and pollination and food. The question I suggest you look at, and I really suggest that you uh, put a lot of uh, a lot of time and a lot of weight on these, uh, is the 2015 question 11, because that was worth 60 marks.